Uh, thanks, everyone. All right, it's gonna be like SeaWorld here, okay? I'm gonna wear, not wear my mask while I'm talking, but that means like these first two rows are the splash zone at SeaWorld, okay? So you can't be here, uh, you'll get wet. All right, uh, I wanna start off right off the bat, I have a trigger warning. I'm going to be playing an animated video of chest compression, so not that big a deal, shows the heart, shows some animated blood vessels running through, okay? And then I'm gonna be showing an approximate two minute audio clip of someone in a medical emergency. It is very distressing. Um, if it has people um, very sad in a chaos type situation, there is um, someone that's very, very sick. So uh, I'm going to just straight out here tell you there's a trigger warning for that. If you are adverse to something like that, I would strongly recommend you either leave for the first portion of the talk or um, just take that into consideration, okay? Uh, I'm Christian Demeth. Uh, here at, at Hacker Summer, it's my 20th year at DEF CON this year. It's kind of crazy. I, I just thought about that. I am old as hell now. But uh, most people call me Quaddy uh, for the summer cons. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of uh, emergency medicine, biomedical informatics, and computer science uh, at the University of California, San Diego. I also co-direct the Center for Healthcare Cybersecurity. We just launched that this last year. We'll talk a tiny bit about that at the end. All right, so. I worked in the emergency department in the Imperial Desert uh, for the last three nights. And I was very sleep deprived. Um, sh shifts are about 10, 11 hours. I saw a lot of patients, a lot of sick patients. And I'm driving back and I started thinking to myself about this talk. And I'd already prepared some content, um, but I think it was a combination of sleep deprivation, too much Red Bull, and uh, the fog on the mountains in between the Imperial Desert and San Diego where I, I kind of came to this thought about reflecting a little bit on my life, and I, I know you're all probably, oh, here it goes, a talk, it's an autobiographical talk, those are the worst. No, no, hear, hear me out for a minute. This talk starts when I was uh, an early teenager. Uh, I played a lot of computer games, built some computers, but a kid down the street uh, really got me into the hacker scene. So this is, um, this is me playing Open Capture the Flag a long time ago at, at uh, DEF CON, and I loved it. He offered, the hacker community offered something to me that nothing ever else did. It's an, a, an excuse to explore a curiosity that otherwise is forbidden, you know? And the authority of it, of like, don't do this because that's improper, just kind of went out the window. And you could couple that with really hard problems that required creative problem solving. That, to me, was like the secret sauce. So I just dove head first. So most of my early teens are all kind of growing up in the hacker community. Never thought it'd be a job. Um, it wasn't called InfoSec or Cyber. It was just like hanging out with your friends and, uh, you know, hanging out in terminals. Then my uh, early, late teens, early 20s, I went to college and I was a philosophy major. And I thought really hard about not having a job. <laughs> um, I could think very deeply about that. And uh, to, make, to make money, my hustle was I did uh, networks, small networks for, uh, Back then, there was a really thriving uh, sector. It was mortgage banking prior to 2008. There's <laughs> so a lot of mortgage banking places opening up, and uh, you know what? They uh, just like proved out they didn't really have a lot of scruples on who they hired, so they'd hire this kid with no real IT background other than just I like, could put together networks or whatnot. So, so it wasn't one of my network cabinets, but mine's are kind of close, all right? No judgment. So I did uh, the network hustle for a lot of small mor mortgage banking companies, but I really wanted to drive an ambulance. <laughs> Who here has ever really wanted to drive an ambulance? Raise your hand. The rest of you are lying. <laughs> the rest, I don't know about the cop thing, man, but I'll tell you, I really wanted to drive an ambulance, okay? So, so I was like, all right, uh, I'm going to go get my EMT. So one summer I went and got my EMT because I wanted to drive an ambulance. So I take my EMT course, I take my test, I go to the ambulance company afterwards, I said, hey, I want a job. And they just laughed at me and they said, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm like 18 and a half. They're like, we never let you drive until you're at least 21, you cannot be employed by us. And I was like, I wish they would have told me that before I took the class. So the only job I could get as an EMT was at an emergency department. I was an emergency department tech. I show up and it's like my first week of orientation, um, seeing some crazy stuff I've never seen before. And it was at a hospital in Tucson, Arizona. It's called St. Joseph's Hospital. It's still there today. 
And uh, it's a moderate-sized community hospital. I bet you many folks in this room would probably go to a hospital just like this if you ever had an emergency. Nothing fancy, no university stuff. They don't do heart transplants or LVADs or crazy cancer treatments. This is your bread and butter hospital in the country we're gonna talk a lot about today. But I saw something in that emergency department my first week that, like I mentioned, I'm driving over the mountains for my shift and things have been crazy and I thought about. And it was the first time I ever saw a code, a cardiac arrest in the emergency department. I have, to my life, ever since, I don't think I've ever been more inspired by a 20 minute event ever since. Why? It's a chaotic symphony, right? It's 10 people coming together immediately with a common purpose, sometimes not even communicating with one another but knowing exactly what to do, sometimes screaming at each other, sometimes disagreeing, coming together to try to save a person's life. And I had never seen anything close to that in my life before. And I said, I want to do that. Went to medical school because, again, you can't make a lot of money as a philosopher. Uh, <laughs> not the money is the, the end all be all, but, uh, and now Josh is a philosopher too, but it's true. Uh, and I saw that cardiac arrest. I said, well, I got to go, got to go to med school. Went to med school and I, I made my whole research focus cardiac arrest. I studied what happens when your heart stops, chest compressions, putting in breathing tubes in feed people, shocking them. I did a bunch of research to try to figure out what could we do to make it more likely that this person who is dead is gonna come back to life. And there was one uh, particular project that sticks to me to this day and it was, uh, it started off with a regular meeting, this big wig, fancy academic guy, great guy, Ben Barbaro. Uh, he says, hey, I got a project for you, but it's a lot of work. I said, okay, tell me about it. So I need you to listen to like a thousand recordings of 911 calls where someone goes into cardiac arrest. And I need you to time stamp when they recognized, when the dispatcher on the other end recognized there was a cardiac arrest, when they told them to start CPR, when they told them to, when they stopped doing CPR, when they shocked, I need you to listen to these thousands of calls and record every single one of them for what happened. And uh, I did that. I did it over uh, two and a half years of medical school. It's over a thousand calls, I recorded all that stuff. A bunch of papers came out from it. Um, and hopefully it made a big difference. But I'll tell you, that, that'll drain you. Right, that will really eat at your soul. The thing about CPR is that the person's dead. You haven't stopped it from happening. You didn't give them blood pressure medicines, you didn't treat their diabetes, you didn't treat their cholesterol. Some catastrophics happen now and you're just trying to make it less bad. And the way you make it less bad it's by pumping on the chest. As you begin compressions, you are creating an artificial pump and doing the work of the heart manually. With each good, effective compression, you are building up pressure in the system, which will move blood around the heart and up to the brain. It does take time to get the blood moving with CPR, so it is very important to push hard and push fast to build the pressure up, which keeps blood going to the brain. Pushing down at least two inches allows for the heart to be squeezed and blood to move out. Pushing at a rate of 100 to 120 compressions per minute is next. All right, you're like, am I taking a CPR class? What's Literally. going on here? When your heart stops, the clock starts. No blood flow to your brain between zero and four minutes, probably have a little damage. Higher risk from four to six. Six to 10, maybe you don't walk again. After that, maybe, well, you probably don't make it. But maybe you don't feed yourself, maybe you're not awake, you don't recognize your friends and family, you can't move your body. So every minute matters. I'm gonna try a thing I've never done before. I got a little uh, timer here. I'm gonna set it to four minutes to signify 
the time at which if we don't do anything, we don't restore some blood flow to this patient's brain, things are gonna die. I'm gonna hand it to you if you're okay with that. And then when it dings, you just send it to someone else, put it to four minutes and we'll just keep going, okay? Everyone, just kind of pay attention to the ding, because four minutes goes fast. This is the recording I was talking about earlier. So last minute on the trigger warning, okay? Okay, what's the problem there? Uh, my husband, he's going through chemo. He, I don't know if he's breathing right now. Okay, he's can you let breathing. me see his chest is falling and rising? It is a little bit, but he's turning blue. Okay. Matt, what's your last name, Matt? Baker, B-A-K-E-R. All right, and you're on cell phone? Three yes, yes. Matt, come on, honey. Okay. Matt, look How at me. How old is he, ma'am? Matt, he's 39. 39? Huh. Yes. Matt? Honey, you gotta wake up. Matt? Can you get him on? Where is he right now? Well, we're, we're upstairs right in bed. Okay, is there any way you can get him onto the floor on his back? Uh, he's on his back on the bed. I'll try and get him up. Okay, are you there by yourself? Yeah. So my, my dad came over. Okay, yeah. see if you can get him on the floor on his back and we'll start CPR. Okay, come on. Come on, Matt. Hey, come on. I've already dispatched you three units. I just want to try to get him on the floor so we can help him, okay? He's on the floor. He's on the floor. Okay, what I want you to do is I want you to tilt his head back a little bit. Tilt it from the chin and your hand on his forehead and tilt his head back. No. Can you do that? Dad, let's go. Let's go. If they want me to do CPR, I'm going to do it. Anyone know how long that was? You know. <laughs> Anyone else? Four minutes? That was two minutes. Two minutes gone. We're halfway to the brain starting to die. And we haven't even started. That's no, nothing wrong with the 911 dispatcher or the person. I'm just giving you guys the facts. That minutes matter. Okay. I thought I came to a hacking conference. <laughs> wow, I also promise I'm not this much of a bummer in real life. <laughs> uh, but we're talking about serious stuff today. I think I have five or six takeaways for you guys today. One, you've already learned, CPR, do it. Two inches at a rate of 120 about, 110, 120, okay? Hard and fast, come full off the chest, good job. You learned something today if you didn't already know that. Number one, modern medicine is critically dependent on connected technology. Not a little bit, I mean, get around without it. We are critically dependent on it. I'm 37, I trained um, in medicine and I've never used a paper chart, ever. Never done medicine where I had to write things out on paper. It's all on the electronic health record. It's all using connected medical devices that connect to our network. It's all using third-party cloud provider stuff now. It's all using um, web apps on your internet to do paging. Even when things are literally like minutes matter, like I mentioned, we use point-of-care ultrasound, for instance, to take a look at a patient's heart to know if I have to do A or B and if I don't know that, I might do something that kills the patient. Put a little science to this. There was a study done, and this, was, this is almost 10 years old. Four minutes. 
It's a study that looked at uh, emergency department doctors, and so they had some people follow them around for a whole shift, eight-hour shift, and they measured how much time they spent doing various tasks. And you can read it above, but if you didn't look or if it's really hard to see, give an idea of how much time they spent putting stuff into a computer with data entry. 40% of their eight-hour shift is just them typing on a computer. 16 or so percent, if I remember correctly, is actually interacting with patients. Some of that is talking with other doctors, again, on computers, on phone lines, using paging systems. And then at, during an eight-hour shift, they clicked over 4,000 times on a mouse. This is underestimating what it is now. I want to repeat this study. I guarantee you it's going to be like 8,000 clicks and we talk to patients for like a minute. Raise your hand. Yeah, doctors even talk to you anymore? No? I'm sorry. I, some talks I go through this whole lengthy discussion about what it takes to take care of a patient that's having a stroke. We go through the line by line. We talk about all the different steps and it summarizes into this slide. I'm not going to do that today other than just to show you guys that could be cardiac arrest, could be stroke, could be some other really, really serious thing, and they have to go all the way from their home, to the 911 system, to get dispatched from the computer-aided dispatch system of the ambulance company. Hopefully GPS is working and they can triangulate their position, because otherwise sometimes they show up really late. The facilities at the hospital are all uh, uh, control systems that we've talked about, whole smattering of outdated uh, elevators, um, water systems, sanitation systems, all of which we've talked at length today about how we're critically dependent on. We use connected medical devices like CT scanners, electronic health records, network connected medication dispensers, and all of that has to work in perfect harmony for patients like the cardiac arrest victim that you just saw, that you heard, to have a chance. All right. I hope you're a little convinced that we can't do this without all this technology. Takeaway two, they're increasing. Does anyone think they're not increasing? Do I have to science this a little bit? No. Does this really matter? This is a paper that Hen and Apresh put out in JAM, which is great. It just showed ransomware attacks on healthcare organizations. This is actually three years out of date. We're blown past these numbers now. It's way worse now. But you can see that's a uh, interesting trend. I just want to look at 2021, over 90 healthcare delivery organizations hit. Now those are healthcare delivery organizations, not hospitals. So it cuts both ways. It can be a healthcare delivery organization that's not a hospital, maybe it's an orthopedic clinic, maybe it's something else. But one of those healthcare delivery organizations can be 10 hospitals and only count as one. Really underestimates it in some way. Oh, 2024 has been a banger year, hasn't it, for healthcare cyber? Uh, we had change. Anyone get jacked up on change? Oh, yeah. I still owe a lot of beer to my team for that. What? Sorry? Sorry? Yeah. You're from change? I'm from McKesson. Oh, Former boo this man! I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We won't, we won't throw stones. We all live in glass houses. <laughs> Wow, what an attack change was. Um, made all this national news, messed up a lot of your guys' months. But I'm gonna confess, I've been doing healthcare cyber for a while, like over 10 years now. I didn't know change existed. Yeah, of course, it's one thing in your mind to be like, oh yeah, these critical dependencies and third-party risk is an issue, and there's catastrophic failures and all these things. But like, we do a great job of just Ignoring that part of our brain, don't we? Until something like this happens. Oh, there are a lot more of these. And the aftermath is gonna be felt for years. There was immediately hospital systems that like, couldn't pay their bills, they couldn't make payroll. But what's gonna happen later on when all those cascading failures of financial constraints, another four minutes, We're going to see closures of practices and I think eventually hospitals from this. Takeaway three. All right, cyber attacks. 
I know I'm supposed to take a shot when I say cyber, but I just had a lot of Red Bull, and I can't start drinking this early. Anyone hear about Ascension? Okay, again, another 2024 attack, this is big. This kind of comes on the heels of change, it's kind of like a one-two punch. And what I want to impress upon you guys is a concept we're gonna talk about a little bit later, but it's this, not just are we critically dependent on third-party vendors, things like change, the plumbing of the, the digital infrastructure and back end of healthcare, but uh, we're consolidating. Hospitals are getting business, they're getting bought up, things are getting more and more consolidated. And we're seeing more attacks like Ascension where it's not just one hospital or two hospitals that go down, it, it is spreading across the country, several states. I have uh, some social media grabs for you folks. Um, for some, so if you don't believe, if you think this is all overblown and you think that this is bullshit and that we, it's not, just look at some folks' comments on Reddit and they never lie on Reddit. This is accurate, 100%, but I feel like these are probably a little unfiltered realism here, okay? Cyber attack in the largest health care system in the country. No one knew uh, where the forms were. Thank God we have a separate sign out with our patients' medications. Nurses are writing them down from memory. This is a new reality, we need to be better prepared. I was just told the internet may be out for days. We're still on our previous owner's network and they're down in multiple states. Here's someone from Vermont. They never taught me how to paper chart in nursing school. I'm fucked. Oh, sh I didn't get a clearance to curse, did I? All right, that's done. <laughs> Sounds like a cyber attack. The electronic health record's completely down. It's an absolute nightmare in the emergency department right now. Fortunately, admin issued a statement that our care teams are trained for these kinds of disruptions, which is interesting because right now I can't get a Tylenol in under two hours. Damn, must be every Ascension hospital. We just, brought, we just bought a trauma, so this is a patient that suffered a trauma, to an Ascension hospital and the trauma team was freaking out because half the team didn't get the page or notification. They're on paper charts, handwriting orders, and doing consults over their personal phones. Ah, oh, man, we got CrowdStrike? VSOD. <laughs> You're probably happy that CrowdStrike's happened now because no one's mad at you anymore. They can just be mad at CrowdStrike. Okay, changes it, the news cycle, huh? This is some screen grabs from uh, Reddit about uh, CrowdStrike. I swear to God, I pulled this off of Reddit. I, someone drew this in a hospital. This, this picture here is on the board where they're tracking patients because the systems that track patients are no longer available. They had to go to whiteboards and try to figure out what patients were still in the hospital, where they were, and where they needed to go. Right, so this was on a whiteboard and someone drew that picture underneath it. They didn't draw it, I think, I mean, of course, it might be a little funny. There's truth in that. When the nurses and doctors on the ground go publicly to the media, and I've never seen this with any other attack. Ascension was the first attack I saw where we saw nurses and doctors talking openly to the media about patient safety issues, essentially blowing the whistle. But look at some of the other stuff they said. Our ICU telemetry monitors are down, so they can't monitor. Uh, it's the sickest patients in the hospital go to the ICU. Their monitors were down. I saw at the needle, neonatal intensive care unit, the tiny babies, was down in some of our hospitals. That nearly broke me. Our monitor stayed up, but we lost the ability to upload labs in our electronic health record. We can't compare EKGs. Four minutes. Cyber attacks degrade, delay, disrupt, and decay the digital systems that power timely, life-saving medical care. But enough of the stories and Reddit screen grabs. Let's go through a little data. All right, I'm a scientist. I, I think so. I, Play one on TV, maybe. I think we got some stuff to show you. Would you believe it if I told you that there's not a single paper published in a peer-reviewed journal that talks about what happens to patients at a hospital that's been ransomed? Would you believe that? We have so many. You're telling me there's not a single paper that went to a hospital that got ransomed and looked and see what, saw what happened to their patients. 
Did they survive? What happened to them? There's none. I'm sorry? Global. There's not a single peer-reviewed paper in a journal published that talks about patient outcomes at a hospital that's been ransomed. Why? Uh, are there lawyers in the room? Well, it's lawyers, 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 I think, is a big part of this. But let's just not all blame the lawyers. Why, why, why are we talking about lawyers? It's the standard thing, right? You get hit, you gotta put out some communications, the lawyers say not to say it's a cyber attack, they're worried about lawsuits and whatnot. But I think the big reason is that lawyers, 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 reduce the risk to the institution, let's not talk about it, okay. The other thing I wanna bring up is that the way we figure out if patients get good or bad care is by looking at data that's in the electronic health record, right? So how long did it take for me to give a patient antibiotics that was really, really sick? If I give patients really, really sick with an infection, I give them antibiotics really quickly, they do better. How do I know how long it took me to give them antibiotics? I look at the timestamp in the electronic health record. That's the logs, that essentially. Well, log's gone. So we can't even measure, in a lot of sense, what happened to patients. So the only thing that we have is the record that's scrawled on a piece of paper that no one can read is incomplete and was written literally in a chaotic event. Wouldn't paper charts still have that though? Yeah, paper charts might. Paper charts are non-standard. They rely on the person to record and they're often in, in, incomplete and in, in, uh, illegible. So we tried to go back and ask a hospital if we could look at their paper records during a ransomware attack and see what happened. And what do you think happened? They started laughing. They started laughing, that was pretty close. But possibly. All right, so we did the next best thing. This paper is born out of frustration. I've tried for years to measure this effect. The best I could get is what happens next to a hospital that's been hit with ransomware, okay? It's a paper we published uh, last year, and it goes like this. In 2021, in San Diego, there was a large ransomware attack. I didn't say it. And it got hit, uh, all their hospitals are in San Diego County, they all got hit, they were down for almost a month. I am employed at a hospital in San Diego County where two of our hospitals are literally across the street from those hospitals, okay? So I did the next best thing. If I couldn't see what was going on on the other side of the street, I measured what happened at my shop. I measured the ripple blast effect over to us. I'll tell you a story. Walked in on a Sunday to work my shift in the emergency department, walking up, and there's a line of folks outside of the, waiting, of the emergency department waiting to check in. That hasn't happened since the throes of COVID where I worked. And I was like, whoa, something's up. I walk in and I look, as I'm walking back to the doctor's area, I take a look to the right and there's a window, shows the waiting room, the waiting room's full. I sit down with the other doctors and I'm like, what's up? They said, there's a ransomware attack in town and the, all the ambulances are getting diverted to us. All the patients are coming over to us because uh, it's really busy over there. We measured four weeks before the attack Four minutes. We measured four weeks before the attack, four weeks during the attack, and four weeks after. And I'm not gonna kill you guys with this. But what happened to our emergency, to peasant, emergency patients? Number one, we saw way more than them. That's our census. We saw 2,300 ambulances the month of the attack, and we only saw 1,700 the month before. We saw huge amounts of ambulance traffic. We admitted more patients. More patients left without seeing doctors. They came, the wait was too long, and they left. More patients left against medical advice. We said, hey, you probably should stick around, and they said, I'm out, and they left even after seeing a doctor. If you got admitted to the hospital, you waited longer to get a bed, and if you were waiting in the emergency department, you waited about 40% longer than you normally would, just because there was an attack going on across the street. What happened in the ambulances? This is a graph that shows Again, four weeks before the attack, four weeks during the attack, and four weeks after the attack. This is, let me explain this. This is the number of hours that hospitals in San Diego County are on what's called diversion. That means, hey, we are overwhelmed, um, overrun, out of commission, we cannot take ambulances right now. 
So this is all hospitals in San Diego. We add up the amount of time per day that they go on diversion and we represent it in this graph. And I'm, again, I'm not gonna kill you with this, but look at that spike. One day at the height of the attack, there was over 190 hours where hospitals in San Diego County were not taking ambulances. Anecdotally, this is the highest rate of diversion that San Diego has ever seen. Not COVID, ransomware attack put our hospitals on diversion more than any other event in the history of us collecting this data. And what happened to our stroke patients? Three out of the four hospitals were stroke centers. People don't stop having strokes because the hospital's on diversion, they come to other stroke centers and we just got hammered with strokes ambulance after ambulance after ambulance coming because we're the only stroke center. Well, there's a couple other ones, but there's only a certain number of them left. Conclusion. It's not what just happens at your hospital or your company anymore. It's what happens in the community of the web around it as well. The ecosystem is incredibly vulnerable and the, re re the resiliency is not there. The depth to absorb something like this does not exist. And this was an urban place that has over 10 hospitals in a single city. If this is a rural hospital in the middle of Idaho or New Mexico, and it's the only place that delivers care within 200 miles, and that's the hospital that gets hit, what happens to you when you get sick? Minutes matter. We're almost up on another four minutes. You have a cardiac arrest? You think you're gonna get effective care and the time needed when there's a ransomware attack going on? The answer is no. In my mind, when I made this slide, I, I Googled come full circle. And this is what came up, what do you think? Intuitive? All right, maybe I'll change that for next time. We started out this talk talking about cardiac arrest and how I grew up wanting to help those patients that were having it. And I grew up a hacker. And I wanted to ask the following question. I wanted to see what happens to those patients that have cardiac arrest, just like the one you heard that recording of, with the same thing. During a ransomware attack. Four weeks before, four weeks during, four weeks after. You saw that video when we're pushing on the chest and it's building up circulation and it's restoring blood flow to the brain, right? That's going to give you more time. That four minutes, that six minutes, that 10 minutes, it can get prolonged if you do good CPR. We can be giving some blood to your brain. And so maybe you don't have as much brain damage. Maybe we can get you out 20, 30 minutes. We finally get your heart started again and you're able to come back. That's the whole point of it. CPR helps us reduce the chance of significant brain damage when we try to get your heart started back up. But there's another concept I need to talk to you guys about before I give you guys the punchline of this paper. Another four minutes. It's that we might get your heart back. But we might not get your brain back. There's a concept in cardiac arrest research called survival to favorable neurologic outcome. I'm sorry, I don't come up with these names. I wish they made them more accessible. But it basically means not only do you survive your cardiac arrest, but that you have a favorable neurologic outcome. It might not mean you're normal, but maybe you walk, maybe you talk, maybe you can feed yourself, all right? So that's the goal. If you have cardiac arrest, high quality CPR, we get your heart started back as soon as possible and hopefully we've saved as much of your brain as we possibly can. I wanna ask the audience here before I show we're gonna do a little hand raising exercise, okay? I want you to raise your hand if you think we can get folks back, we can restart their heart after their heart stops 90% of the time, raise your hand. Oh, you guys are, you guys are pessimists like me, aren't you? 80%, 70%, okay? 60%, 50%, 30, 20, 10, okay. All right, so there's smattering. Starts about 60 and down, uh, in reality, the ability for us to get your heart started back up is probably nationally sub 20%, okay? It's not like TV. 
In fact, if you go look at all, the, one of my favorite studies is they went and looked at all the TV shows like ER, and they looked at what their arrest rate, when they get them back, like I got them back, and they shock them, and it's 90%. In the TV shows, they get them back 90% of the time. When you ask the general population, most people think it's 80, 90%, it's because they watch TV. We tell them the real numbers, it's like, like sub 20. Depends on where you have a cardiac arrest, but it's sub 20. Is that even in hospitals, or is that just Great question, it's all comers. So if you have a cardiac arrest outside of the hospital or inside the hospital, but your odds of coming back if you have a cardiac arrest in the hospital are much, much higher, okay? Much more 50, 60% ish higher. So good question, but all comers, if your heart stops, no matter where you are, you, you're looking at pretty poor odds. We looked at that in our ransomware scenario we just talked about, and what happened in 2021. And in our patients, that we took care of that had cardiac arrest, we had about a 40% chance of getting them heart started with favorable neurologic outcome. It's all comers in San Diego, it's pretty good, right? So if you had a cardiac arrest in San Diego, an average month, we're rocking about 40% or so, we'll get you back and you're gonna have okay neurologic function at least. What, it, what was it during the ransomware month? We have guesses? 10? Five. Five? Five. If you look real hard, you can see it in the slide. 4.5% chance. It's so normally 40, and just because there's a ransomware attack across the street, your chance goes from 40 to four. It's this paper. Yep, it's this paper right here. You guys can all look it up if you want. 40% to 4.5% chance for the victim to be able to walk, talk, and feed themselves. No patient care is affected. Yeah. There, Josh said no patient care was affected. We know. How can you say that? Takeaway four, all right, critically dependent, and we're seeing more and more attacks. Attacks are harming people. But what's the future look like? I'll tell you right now, um, you probably shouldn't take what I say without significant salt intake. I know I'm a doctor, I'm not supposed to say that. There's a recent meta-analysis that said salt deprivation diets don't really do anything, so. Maybe you should take everything I say with a salt shaker instead of a grain of salt, but whatever. Sorry, Dr. Humor. What's the future look like? It looks like shit. The first thing is that rural healthcare is collapsing. Okay, so smaller rural critical access hospitals, even some community hospitals in urban settings, it is not looking good. And there are so many reasons why that's the case, and there are no silver bullets to figure it out. And I am not the expert that could give you a list of, a, of why this is happening, other than to say there are huge financial pressures, there are big geographic shifts happening in this country of like population shifts, there is in hugely spiking costs, and the answer to so much of these rural hospitals closing is one of two things, too bad, or maybe they'll cut services to stay afloat. Maybe they took care of uh, kids. They had a pediatric ward. Or maybe they delivered babies. They had an OBGYN uh, obstetrics unit. But those never made money. And they have to stop those to keep the hospital afloat. So maybe the hospital still survives, but it's not really a full hospital. Nearest care ends up being another several hundred miles away if you want to have a kid. Or what's really happening a lot is... Uh, bigger hospital systems are buying up smaller systems. This terrifies me so, so, so much. For a variety of reasons. Yeah, maybe monopolistic stuff, sure. But I am looking at what happened with change. I'm looking at what happened at Ascension. I'm looking at what happened at UHS before. And so when you buy a new healthcare system, you take two more hospitals onto your network, 
you're not going to use their systems. You're going to put them on yours. So all of a sudden, you are supporting the digital infrastructure, electronic health record, connected medical devices, and networks of 20 hospitals. And if you get whacked with CrowdStrike, instead of one or two hospitals getting hit, it's 20. And this is just going to accelerate. Like, we're not coming back from this. It's an existential threat for so many of these hospitals, and a lot of the answer ends up being consolidation. The risk for catastrophic failure is growing. Furthermore, I want to make sure we have some t time for questions about this, so I'm actually going to circle back a little bit at this at the end, because I want this to be a discussion. But a lot of what we're talking about today is about critical infrastructure, cross-dependencies, and failures. What does a hospital use water for? We talked a little bit about it, if you were here in the last talk or two. But let me just put it into perspective a little bit. Some of our imaging devices cool themselves with water. Some of our data centers that host our electronic health records in the cloud are all cooled by water. Our MRI machines, some of them are cooled by water. I won't be able to get, uh, I won't be able to characterize your tumor growth in your brain. I won't be able to tell if you had a subtle stroke that I didn't pick up on your CT scan. That might matter, really, really matter that I get that MRI. Infection control, hospitals are, by definition, cesspools, right? The sick patients go to hospitals that have the infections. We work tirelessly, clean floors, clean surfaces, infection control, and core to that is water. So you have patients that already have infections, and not just you run the mill infections. Sometimes these patients, another four minutes, some of these patients have drug-resistant infections. You don't want to spread around. Sometimes they have tuberculosis. Sometimes they have vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. Sometimes they have Clostridium difficile, and the only thing you know that kills that, hand sanitizer doesn't do it. You gotta wash your hands. Labs. I might not know you're having some emergent condition unless I do some blood tests. One of the core requirements of a functioning laboratory system is water. So it might be the difference between whether I find out you have a condition at all, or maybe the difference between I find out you have a condition today versus two weeks from now, and two weeks from now it's too late. And on and on and on, we're gonna come back to this. Some patients have feeding tubes they can't eat food. We gotta mix the, their nutrition with water to feed them. We need water to make the cafeteria function to feed all the rest of the patients in the hospital, and they're too sick to leave. I mean, it's terrifying to think about what that would do at one week, two week, three weeks. We do not have the prepared amount of water to deal with that for two days, let alone two weeks. Takeaway six, the problems are very hard to make better quickly. I'm gonna make some analogies here. I'm checking these with you guys. You tell me afterwards if it doesn't make sense, but we talked about cardiac arrest. What are your risk factors for having cardiac arrest? There's a whole bunch of them. Maybe you're really unlucky and you have a genetic disease and it messed with your sodium potassium pumps in your heart. I'm sorry, that's really unfortunate. Maybe you smoke. Maybe you're really old. Maybe you like bacon like I do. Maybe you're super stressed out. It just kind of just looks like summer, hacker summer camp in a slide, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm just thinking about that now. This is kind of like, yikes. Okay, well, we're gonna just gloss past that. I'm starting to think about this problem kind of like cardiac arrest. We have so much, so many issues going on with the security of our hospitals, the technical debt, the lack of effective cybersecurity workforce, the amount of money to fix some of these things, and I kind of liken them to risk factors for catastrophic failure, right? Just like having a heart attack and heart disease risk factors, how many of these does your hospital have right now for cyber? 
right? And then I kind of think about cardiac arrest as the failure, the catastrophic failure of the system. And the cyber analogies, maybe something like ransomware. Kind of talked about this already. Lack of financial resources, lack of cybersecurity expertise, legacy systems including medical devices, consolidation, third party risk, geopolitics and international law. The economics of ransomware. The list goes on and on, but there are a lot of risk factors. So let's think about this like cardiac arrest. We can talk about all the problems and we can start working to solve some of all those risk factors. Talk about policy, we can train up a workforce, we can do all these things, and we should. Because the prevention is really gonna pay off in the end. It's way more cost effective to do prevention than it is to do response. But we still do CPR because people are still having cardiac arrest. And what's the CPR equivalent to a hospital under ransomware attack? Respiration? I'm sorry? Restoration, Restoration yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are talking about hospitals that have all of these risk factors. Why do they have these risk factors? You know, we could talk a lot about, right? But we're not gonna change those overnight. And we're asking for the same folks that work under these constraints to restore their system as quickly as possible. The restoration side of it is incredibly important, but it's not seven days. Josh told me today, it's like, was it seven versus seven weeks? Finance, an outage of seven days would never be tolerated, and we get recovery back from ransomware in the financial sector much quicker, but it's seven weeks for healthcare. Why? It's not because people are staying home, and the teams that are at these hospitals um, aren't trying their hardest. I've, I've been at hospitals that have been ransomed. I'll tell you, it's stressful. They're trying their hardest, they're sleeping. Yeah, we need to go quicker. We need to take that seven week downtime and take it down to seven hours. That's what we should be doing. We should be, it's not seven weeks, seven hours. We need to take out the part that's hurting patients. If you have the teams working to restore these systems as quickly as possible, and maybe we come and restore like replacement technology can I roll up to a hospital under ransomware attack and basically restore some of their functionality using a different system to bridge them? Yeah, and to bridge them until so that patients don't get hurt. I'm sorry? Business continuity plan, absolutely. I've, I just, in the last year and a half, have been hanging out a lot with emergency managers and business continuity folks. I've never had previously. There are a lot of issues um, with hospitals and their emergency managers and their business continuity plans when it comes to cyber. But that's a great thing for folks in this room to do, right? They, hospitals are generally pretty good at put preparing for things like hurricanes, tornadoes, maybe power outages, maybe, at least they have plans. Those are the hazards that they're used to, right? If you have a hospital in Florida, you probably have a pretty good plan for when a hurricane rolls through, right? I did a study, it's not up here, I can share it if you want. We asked a bunch of hospitals where on their list of vulnerabilities they put cyber? A lot of folks put ransomware high on their vulnerability assessment. And then we asked them if they're prepared and they said no. So I think there's tons of work we can do in the emergency management, business continuity space to educate folks in the hospital space about cyber. Because all they know is what they see on CSI or you know, what they see on the internet of the matrix or something. They, they don't understand it. They don't understand how it works. They don't understand how it's gonna impact them. And so that's a great thing for folks in this room to help partner with them, to help educate them, and help them develop plans that can actually be effective. Because right now, a vast majority of them do not, and if they do, they're probably crap. I, I'm co-directing this new center where we're trying to figure out a lot of that stuff. Like, we're trying to ask these questions. What patients are at highest risk during a ransomware attack? not just like of their information getting stolen, but like, is it the stroke patients? Is it the cardiac arrest patients? It's the patients that just got chemotherapy yesterday, and we don't know what's gonna happen to their white blood cell count in the next 48 hours. Is it the patients in the ICU that just had a heart transplant? 
is that the trauma patients, you know, trying to understand which of these populations are the most vulnerable and what it would take to continue to support them to the same quality and level before the ransomware attack is one of the things we're working on. What are the required technologies and how generalizable are they? Anyone here kind of work in healthcare and wants to raise their hand? Oh yeah, yeah, you guys get this. Uh, keep your hand up if you still use paging. Oh, you guys are lying. Oh yeah, come on. Does anyone else that's not in healthcare use paging anymore? What's the new paging? Laura. No? Doctors love pagers and they love faxing stuff still. All right. Um, I don't know the answer. We definitely require faxing. And a lot of people just say, like, fax it to me. But uh, whether or not they like it or not, I don't know. What other critical required technologies and how ubiquitous are they? You know, I'll tell you what, guess what? You have a cardiac arrest in the field and they get you back. The medics come there, they shock you, they get you back in the field and they do an electrocardiogram, they put some stickers on your chest and they take a look at the waveforms of your heart and they see that you're having a massive heart attack. Guess how they get the doctors from home to get into the hospital to fix your heart? Guess what they use? What? Use pagers. I'm gonna repeat that. You have a cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest, you're having a massive heart attack that cardiologists are gonna come in and fix your heart, are gonna know about your issue from a page. Makes you feel like the paging system is pretty important, don't you? These are the types of questions and trying to map these critical technologies and be like, well, the paging system better work. Or we better get off paging and get something better. There are a lot of things we could talk about, but you gotta map it first and you gotta see how ubiquitous is it. If it's only in 5% of the hospitals, then why are we worrying about it? We really gotta go for the highest yield stuff. Some question over here? No? Yep. Yeah. So it's being brought up that there are a lot of, there's a lot of consolidation in healthcare technology as well. And electronic health records are basically the operating system of healthcare. You can't do anything with patients or healthcare without electronic health records, and there are only a handful of vendors. So there are lots of these critical vendors that are highly consolidated that have a huge risk associated with this. Um, whether we're having conversations with them, uh, or not, uh, yes, the answer is yes, but it's not just them, it's all sorts of folks. And there's a lot of stuff, I mentioned earlier, I had never heard a change before. There, I wanna know how many changes are out there that I don't even know exist. A lot. How do I know after I've gone and looked that I got them all? There's no list, there's no process, there's no map, we don't know. Is it feasible to rapidly detect hospital systems getting hit with ransomware without having them tell us. We talked about lawyers, lawyers, lawyers. If I can find out that something's happened, can I detect that without them really telling me? Because I wanna go and help them. You know, can I roll up with 18 wheelers full of hardened parallel technology that I can just roll out to any hospital in the country and take care of patients, just like they did before the ransomware attack, or to a pretty decent standard, and I can deploy within six hours. You know, Do we need a national strategic stockpile of technology for that? Do we need specialized teams that can respond at the state and national level at that? These are questions that we're wrestling with, because right now hospitals are just left to their own devices, not in a, not in a bad way, but they're just drowning. And that's why they're down for seven weeks. That's not why they're down for seven days. It's because they don't have a lot of help. And then, yeah, maybe we can dream up some, 18, some 18 wheelers and pull this stuff out, but is it, a, is it a pipe dream? How does it actually work? You know, there's usability issues and stuff like These are the big questions of today. And uh, cool, let's take some questions. Thank you all. Uh, that was my first run at this new talk. Hopefully you guys liked it, yeah? All right. 
Um, do you do you have a, an understanding or an idea, or has somebody done research on what has caused hospitals to get hacked? Is there is there any data that that could be shared with others? Yeah. Around the there's no no good data. Um, there this this is a whole other issue. But basically, um, 200 years ago, if you had a cold and you went to your doctor, they'd say like put some leeches on it and here's some mercury and like here's some foxglove to like. We, in my opinion, are in the leeches, bloodletting, and mercury phase of evidence when it comes to cybersecurity just broadly. We it's all cult of personality, it's all expert opinion, it's all frameworks without actual science. So to your answer, just as a meta answer to that, is just to say no. But two, there are gonna be a lot of vendors that tell you they have the secret sauce, right? And they're gonna have a sweet deck, and they're gonna have like, oh, just buy our MFA and look at all these ransomware attacks going down. It's all bullshit. It's phishing. Yeah, phishing. Yes, yeah, phishing is uh, what it is now. There's no good phishing interventions. We can talk a lot about that too. Um, but the answer is no. I don't think we have evidence to say this is why. We have a lot of people like me and other folks that will give their opinions. Maybe it has to do with the fact that they have a lot of competing technological requirements of them. They have to share data with patients. They have to share data with anyone through certain APIs. They have to have a thousand different users or more, like sometimes tens of thousands of users accessing the same information in electronic health record. Maybe there's some structural stuff like that, but to be honest, I think it has to come down with economics, right? The reason hospitals and things are getting ransomed a lot, I believe in part, and get no evidence, is because it pays to do it. And if the market dynamics were different and the economics weren't there, we wouldn't see nearly as many hospitals getting ransomed. So in my experience, uh, it seems like this issue of not having proper cybersecurity precautions in place already is more a matter of financial constraints. And so is there, what, what have you discovered about getting hospitals to step away from profit and move, move it towards patient care? Um, and also, as a side note, adequate staffing. Um. The conversation at the top where the money is has changed a lot in the last 10 years. I remember this was like not an issue at all. And now it's an issue, but I don't think there has been a commensurate investment. We could talk about regulation as a potential mechanism for that. There's a lot of discussion at the federal level here about minimum uh, requirements for hospitals as a condition for Medicaid, stuff like that. Um, I, I wish I could give you an expert answer to that because the more and more I look into this problem, the more and more I try to understand it, the more complex it gets. And there are things that I would never even begin to understand or the financial constraints in some of these places that make me sometimes question something as simple as, we'll just put more money into it or just hire more people. It's like two things can be right at the same time. Like we need more money, we need more people, but we also need a new nurse practitioner to handle 150 diabetic patients who if we don't, help them get their diabetes under control, they're gonna end up cardiac arrests. And it's like seen often as a zero sum game. I don't know how to break that vicious cycle because there's always going to be someone saying, this is important, this is important. We're all cyber folks, or most of us are cyber folks. We think this is the highest priority. In a lot of ways it probably is, but maybe it isn't always. And so if we're always crying wolf and we're always saying, if we don't do this, everyone's gonna die, I don't know how much longevity and real change we're gonna have. At the same time, we gotta show people the data. We gotta tell them that this is the risk to them. And maybe the secret sauce ends up being, you're gonna lose $120 million at least if you get ransomed. And maybe, maybe that is gonna be them, the, the financial motivation to change their minds. It's gonna be, be some combination of strategy. There is no one way. Okay, um, please join me in thanking Dr. Thank <laughs>